Today we're cont continuing in our study of the Apostles' Creed, and we began it last week by thinking about the first two words of the Creed, I believe. Just to remind you that when we say I believe in this sense, it doesn't just mean that I believe that that something is true, but it is the tra uh, faith and trust of commitment and of obedience to the God who is central to this creed, Father revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there is something very intense about the Apostles' Creed. We may say it carelessly, but if we take it to heart, is this something very, very serious indeed? The statement, beginning with the words, I believe in this sense, means that our whole being is shaped by what we are expressing as we say the creed. This morning we come to the first article, as it's called, of, uh, in the creed, which um, ex expresses the object of our belief. I believe in God the Father Almighty. And before we go any further, I think it is useful for us to explore that title, the Apostles' Creed. What does it really mean? Does it really mean that the apostles wrote and comprised the wrote the epistle themselves? Well, for a long time, many centuries in the church, that was what in fact was believed. In about the fourth century, they developed this um, f fantasy notion that the apostles had all contributed one of the clauses in this creed. And it happened in Jerusalem just before they were to go out on their world mission to different parts of the world, and they thought it necessary that they should all get together and agree on the substance of the message that they were to share. And the legend goes like this, that each one of them contributed one of the clauses of the creed. Peter began it with, he said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, heaven, maker of heaven and earth. And then Andrew added, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, and James made the contribution, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And so they went on one after another. And the Apostles' Creed was formed with each of the apostles making his contribution. Well, that is, of course, pure legend. It's what today we would call disinformation. But it was something that continued to be widely believed right down to the 15th century or so, when scholars began to question the origins of various things like the Apostles' Creed. But nevertheless, even though the, tit the, the title is uh, misleading in that sense, it is true in this other sense that the teaching contained in this creed does conform to apostolic teaching. And so the title, or the, the uh, yes, the title Apostles' Creed has continued to be used as a consequence. Now, before we go any further, I think it's important that we should say the words of the creed together once again. Will you join with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was by the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And when we say these words, we're talking about God in a very specific way, aren't we? We're not saying that I believe in God in a general sense or a general vague philosophical sense. We're believing in God who has these particular qualities of Father and almightiness. You see, there's always something specific about God when we read about him in the scripture. As Peter puts it in his first epistle in chapter 1 and verse 3, he, subscribe, he describes him as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's very specific. And when we say the creed, we're saying, I believe in God, not just the Father Almighty, but as we reflect upon it, we ask the question, who's Father? And of course, as we explore it more, we come to the conclusion that he's not only the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he's my Father and your Father. It's very, very specific, and that's what we're going to be exploring this morning, the fatherhood of God. But what do we mean when we use this word Father? Obviously, the words don't have the same literal sense as the statement, Max Little is a father. It's not the same, is it? It's quite something quite different when we're talking about God as a father, and yet not wholly different. There's a link between those two things. We use that father, word father, because we understand at a human level what fatherhood is, and we attribute to God some of those qualities, but yet in an infinite way. And what we're doing is we're using the language of analogy. When we use analogical language, we imply that there's a certain similarity between us and God, while at the same time there is a fundamental difference. We use analogies all the time to talk about God. Some of the analogies are, are quite common in scripture. They are words, uh, analogies like friend or king or shepherd. And sometimes in scripture, they're even taken from creation. They're non-personal analogies like uh, a, a rock. God is a mighty rock. Um, as uh, Luther put in his hymn, uh, a mighty fortress is our God. And so when we talk God our Father, he is neither wholly like a human father, nor is he wholly unlike a human father. There are genuine points of similarity. And we use this language to help us unlock the meaning of God and who he is uh, in our experience. And we use that word father all the time, don't we? You can scarcely ever sing a hymn without the word father in it. And it's scripture is full of references to God as Father. Now, there are, uh, I want to explore this morning with you uh, different aspects of what this word, what this idea of fatherhood means in relationship to God. And the first thing we want to look at this morning is this eternal fatherhood of God. When the creed uses the, uh, speaks of God as Father, it's deliberately reminding us of the doctrine of the Trinity. Firstly, there is belief in God the Father. This is the way the creed is constructed. There is, first of all, belief in God the Father, and then there is belief in his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and thirdly, we confess our belief in the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that we learn from I believe in God the Father is that the Father is eternally a Father. He's eternally fathered 
to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And if you look with me at John chapter 5 and verse 18, you can see the truth of this, that Jesus himself openly expressed this tr uh, truth, and the Jews recognized what he was doing. In John chapter 5, verse 18, they saw very clearly what he was saying. And we read there that this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he's even calling God his Father, making himself equal with God. And that, by the way, is all that you need to get launched into the study of the Trinity. This idea doesn't express anything about the Holy Spirit in this verse, but here's the beginning point where there is this recognition that Jesus himself was claiming equality with God, making himself equal to God. And this is uh, reinforcing this idea of God's eternal fatherhood. And scripture is full of other references itself. Now, God must, this relationship between God uh, and his son must be an eternal relationship. Because, you see, God is love. That is his very nature. And if God is love, he's eternally love. Because God is unchanging. And if God is love, then there must always have been an object to his love. And people sometimes say, well, God created the world in order that he might have something to love. But no, God is eternal. God existed long before the world was created. He had no beginning. And if God is love now, he must always have been loved because his nature is unchanging. So there always must have been that object of love within God himself. You know, I think you can follow my logic. God loved his son eternally. This is eternal love, eternal fatherhood, Trinitarian fatherhood. And that's the first thing that the creed is emphasizing. And let me refer you to two further foundational texts that um, would help you if you wanted to de uh, develop the com components necessary for the doctrine of the Trinity. You couldn't do better than look at these two verses in John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 18. It starts there right from the very beginning where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It doesn't say that the Word, who is, uh, who is um, identified later in this passage as Jesus, it doesn't say that the Word had a beginning. It says that the Word, the Son of God, was there in the beginning with God. He had no beginning. He was there already in the beginning. And then in verse 18 says this in, in, in the ESV translation, which I believe is correct. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus there specifically referred to as God the only God who was at the Father's side has made him known. And notice that, uh, that, that Jesus here is not just called the only begotten Son of the Father, but he is called the begotten God who is with the Father has made him known. And so the Trinity is not something that a, a doctrine of the church that has been found, founded by certain ancient councils of the church and so, so on. They have uh, formulated it, it, but the, the raw materials of the doctrine are there in Scripture for us to see and to discover and believe 
and rejoice in, as we have been singing some of the songs this morning referring to this wonderful fatherhood of God. And it is something, uh, while it is mysterious, and while it is something baffling as we try to understand it more, yet nevertheless it should make our hearts rejoice that our lives are somehow brought into relationship with God who is three in one. Someone asked me the other day, when you say that God the Father is the creator of heaven and earth, does that mean that Jesus wasn't involved in that? Well, the answer to that is yes. All three persons are involved in every work of God. But we, some, we sometimes usually refer different aspects of the work of God to one or other of the persons of the Trinity. And so when we think about creation, we usually refer that to God the Father. But there is scriptural evidence to show that the Son was involved in that and the Spirit himself was hovering over the whole of creation. When we think of redemption, we sort of refer that to the work of Jesus Christ, the Son. He was the one who loved us and died for us. And yet the truth of Scripture is, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And we refer the work of sanctification and the work and the life of the believer to the Holy Spirit and his work of building the church and the communion of saints that we were hearing about this morning. We refer that to the Holy Spirit and yet the Father and the Son are involved in them as well. So let's not divide up the, the Trinity too much but let us recognize that there is this wonderful difference between the Trinity, the Father who loves the Son, the Son who loves the Father, the Spirit who loves the Son and glorifies the Son. This is the first wonderful truth of the creed. The second wonderful truth about fatherhood in the creed is redeeming fatherhood. Not only is God an eternal father, a Trinitarian father, but God is a redeeming father. When the creed speaks of him in this way, it's reminding us of the grace relationship to us through Jesus Christ. And I want to demonstrate just how scriptural this is by noting some key verses on the PowerPoint. And the first one is this, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the eternal fatherhood, who has predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. That's the redeeming fatherhood, that we have been predestined to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself. And so that's the first and good news concerning the fatherhood of God for, human, uh, for fallen human beings. The judge, he was our judge because he has the right to be our judge because he is our creator. And this righteous judge has now, through this wonderful, glorious work of salvation and redemption, through his Son, Jesus Christ, has brought us into his family. As we were singing earlier, we can sing with a real thrill in our hearts, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. There's an assurance and an ass a certainty about it because Scripture affirms it in these words that we have just read. If you turn to John chapter 1 and verse 12, John says this about Jesus, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You see, not all humans are children of God. It's a gift of grace to those who trust in Christ, he gives the right for them to be called children. But we don't have that right by nature. 
We only have that right through grace. And it's because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has died for us upon the cross. And the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, has worked in our lives to bring a conviction of sin and to turn our hearts and minds towards God to receive his grace and to hear his calling that we have become the children of God. And if we can sit and say, and just take that in our stride and not be excited about it, there's something wrong with us because this is the most wonderful truth. And so I found this statement in J.I. Packer where he says this, and I, I was quite struck by it. When the Christian says the first clause of the creed, he puts all this together, that is the eternal fatherhood of God and the redeeming fatherhood of God. He puts it all together and confesses his creator as both the father and savior, of the father of his savior and his own father through Christ. A father, listen to this, a father who now loves him no less than he loves his only begotten son. That is a marvelous confession to be able to make. And that's what we're saying. And that's what we should believe when we say the words of the creed, God the Father Almighty, that God loves us as much as he loves his eternal son. That's the meaning of the cross. That's the meaning of salvation. God loves you and me as much as he loves his own son. Now before I go on, I want to say, acknowledge that for some people, thinking about God as father is actually unhelpful. It's an unhelpful analogy. And I have met a few people like that during my lifetime. I've counseled some people like this in my lifetime. And the reason they have, it's negative for them is because they've had a negative experience of fatherhood in their own personal lives, in their family life. They've had a father who's been abusive or bullying, they may have had a father who has abandoned their mother and them at a young age. And so they have a bitterness in their heart when they hear the word father. It's a, a bitter feeling that's ingrained in them. And if there is anyone here in this service today who is like that, then I just want to share two things with you that might prove helpful. Firstly, Scripture often refers to God and describes God, or often compares God to a, a human mother. The love of God for his people is often compared to the love of a mother for her child. For example, in Isaiah 49 verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget Yet I will not forget you, says the Lord. And then there is Isaiah 66, verse 13. As one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. But the second thing, and secondly, remember this, that the best way of thinking about God is to think about Jesus himself. Remember what he said? He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And what I want to say is this. When you think about God, don't look at him through the lens of your earthly father, however good your father might be. Look at God through the lens of Jesus. And then you will understand what his fatherhood is. Even, however bitter your experience of fatherhood may have been, or however good it may have been, 
the way to look through God the Father is through the lens of Jesus Christ and not through the lens of your earthly father. I hope that will prove helpful. And then, thirdly, there is God's almighty fatherhood. His eternal fatherhood, his redeeming fatherhood, and now his almighty fatherhood. Because, you see, we read, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And when we re say that, we're saying that we believe that the sovereign Almighty Father is someone who is mighty and powerful on our behalf as Father. That's what we're saying. And that's what we've seen already in our study of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, isn't it? I know, you, I know many of you have memorized it, but let's look at it once again. Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And God can only make things work together for our good because he is an almighty father. Those of us who are fathers know what it is to work hard for our families, but there are limitations to what we can do for our families. But no limitations for God. He is almighty, and he is almighty on behalf of his children. And so I have, I want you briefly to notice four things about God's almighty sovereignty. The first thing is this, and that is that all power and authority comes from God. Rulers, governments, and of course Christian leaders all derive their authority from God and they're responsible to him. And we already saw this as we looked at Romans chapter 13, didn't we? But the second thing I want to say this is that God's sovereignty reminds us that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for him. Things that seem impossible to us are perfectly possible with God. I think we all remember Gabriel's gentle rebuke to Mary when she expressed astonishment that she was to give birth to the Savior of the world. And you remember what he said in Luke chapter 1, verse 37? Nothing is impossible with God. It's so easy for us to underestimate him. It's so easy, we who have begun by saying, I believe in God the Father, to start doubting God the Father when difficulties arise and problems come. And we feel perhaps desperately alone in this world or we're suffering. We be suddenly begin, do I really believe in God? Is God really there? We need to remind ourselves that God, nothing is impossible for God. And through in all that we're passing through, God is at work bringing about his purpose for us and our lives. The third thing is this, that divine sovereignty is not lessened by, or compromised, if you like, by the existence of evil. The existence of evil proves the absolute moral distinction between good and evil, a distinction which cannot be sustained in an atheistic universe. And the Bible makes it clear that God is warring against evil and that God will triumph over evil when he brings all things under the sovereignty of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And finally, God's sovereignty is the foundation of hope and security in a fallen world. The word of God emphasizes 
the reliability of God. When God makes a promise, he stands by it. In the words of Psalm 119, verses 11, 7 to 10, the Lord of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even the much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the droppings of the honeycomb. The truth of God's almightiness is surely one of the most comforting truths that a believer can think about, can meditate upon. And I encourage you to think about it and meditate upon it because it's the ground of all of our hopes, of all of our confidence. This ascription of the creed of Almighty to God is designed to stress God's all, rule, all ruling providence. And that is why Paul is, what Paul is talking about in that verse in Romans 8 and chapter 28 that God is working in all things for the good of those who love him. He rules the world for the sake of his children. And we need to realize that we cannot rightly understand God if at any point, if we do not understand this almightiness of the God who is our Father. We often think about his love but let's remember that it's almighty love. It is a love which is quite is fully capable of fulfilling all of his promises and undertakings because there is no limit to his power and there's no thing that can frustrate his power and his work on behalf of his people. We're going to close in a minute or two with the singing of the hymn, This is My Father's World. It's probably a hymn that is familiar to us from our childhood. But when we sing it, as we shall do in a moment, I want us to pay serious attention to the third verse. The third verse explains the truth I've been emphasizing this morning. It puts into words the comfort of God's almightiness, the comfort of his sovereignty, when it says... In that stanza, this is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. It comes right out of scripture, doesn't it? Right out of the book of Psalms. Right out of Paul's writings right out of the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The existence of evil doesn't call into question whether God is in control. It gives him the concrete opportunity to display his dominion over all things for the sake of his people. This is my father's world.